Aloha Friday with Ken Sakata. Aloha, Ken. Aloha, Uncle. Oh, my goodness. You know what? We have the many hoonies that always welcome our guests. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> we get one group of many hoonies from the Mauka. We get on a second group from Makai, so we get them all covered over here, um, right here on the Aloha Friday show. Oh, my goodness. First of all, mahalo nui lo for accepting an invitation to come and join us on our Aloha Friday Witch show. Absolutely. Uh, I know I talked with you um, maybe more than a month ago, and um, we, we talked about Plumeria, and I said, I want to talk about Plumerias, and you said, you know, Uncle... This is not the time to talk about Pumerias. This is the winter time, you know. Nobody in their right mind. I said, okay, okay, let's, let's, let's. <laughs> maybe as soon as the spring Just Wait a little gonna, bit, right? Wait a little bit, wait a little bit. Don't get excited. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, 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 okay. So thank you for uh, remembering. And I came back around and said, remember when we talked? And you said, yes, you know, and so here we are. Um, and for our folks that are joining us, uh, welcome, welcome. This is an interactive uh, chat show. So uh, if you would like to um, post any comments or say aloha, uh, we certainly love to have that. There's Marty Burns that's saying aloha Friday. Um, brother uh, Marty lives, um, I think he, he lives in Paramount, if, not, if I'm not mistaken. And um, we call him uh, Coach Marty over there. He's a, he's a great and he also, he and his wife grow Pumeria, so we're going to talk about oh, Pumeria a little, bit, a little bit later on in the show, and maybe we can offer them uh, him some advice. So, you know what, Ken, what I'd like to do is to start with, at, at the beginning, if you will, uh, okay. because you come from a, uh, a long line of um, uh, uh, folks from the big island, and that's kind of where your family all starts here. You know, they they, they came over to our shores uh, from Japan and uh, ended up on the big island. And I'd like just to show this one picture right over here. Tell us about this picture, Ken. Okay, good. So this is a picture of my mother's mother's family, the Aoki family. And in fact, this year marks the 130th anniversary of their arrival in Hawaii. So if you look in the very middle of the picture, there is a man and woman standing with three little girls um, surrounding them. The smallest little girl, the youngest little girl on the left-hand side of my great-grandmother is actually my mother. And if you see, go all the way to the right-hand side, the gentleman standing or sitting down, I should say, in the uniform is my great uncle Masaichi. So apparently, from what we know, he is the first Japanese to be born on the Big Island and then would go on to become the first Japanese police officer in Kona. And through those great grandparents, the Aoki grandparents, uh, Tano and Bunzo Aoki, I'm one of their 80 great grandchildren. Wow. Wow. That's a great, that's a great picture. We're going into the family archives over here, uh, uh, Ken, just to, uh, just to kind of see, you know, your family. Now tell us about this one. Okay. So this is now a picture of my mother's father's family. So in the center back row standing is my grandfather, who's the oldest of 12 children on the left the woman sitting down holding the baby is his mother, my great grandmother. And on the right, the in the kind of more a little bit to the right of the center is my great great grandmother. Now, on the far right is my grandfather's sister, Asami, and she would go on um, to marry a man named Sanji Abe, and he would be the first Japanese senator from the territory of Hawaii of Japanese ancestry. And through this line of the family, I'm one of 79 great grandchildren. This would be the Miyose and Kaide family. That is a classic, classic picture. Look at those kimonos. Um, look at the geta they're wearing with the tabis. I just love it, man. Yeah, isn't it great you have all these pictures? You know, unfortunately, as a kid, I was very curious. I would ask, who is that person and who's this? So, you know, fortunately, now I can identify, you know, most of the, picture, the people in the pictures. Um, and because of that, one of the role that I play with the family is the keeper of genealogy. So I try to pass on as much of the information about people or, or, or things like that to the ohana. 
So the first of every month, I send out an email with the list of birthdays, wedding anniversaries, and date of passing for both sides of the family. Amazing, amazing. We have Muriel. Uh, Muriel and Carl, good, good friends of ours. Aloha, Muriel. <laughs> Saying aloha. And uh, we miss you and Carl, Muriel. Oh, my goodness. We, um, we definitely um, have... Uh, a Good lot people. of a lot people. of catching up to do, right? <laughs> um, and there's Mohala um, saying aloha, and um, aloha. Mohala um, is uh, lives quite fairly near me here in uh, Simi Valley, and uh, she uh, wow. dances um, with the Aloha Hula Studio in the valley. And um, great, yeah, she's um, she's uh, one of our one of our regulars over here, and. Uh, Marty is saying, I wonder if it's any relation to my brother Harold Abe in Eva Beach. Um, no, as far as I know, not. Different, different Abe. Okay. Different uh, Abe. Different yeah. Abe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so let me see here. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm also um, looking at um, uh, another, another shot here, which I, I really, really liked. And let me see if I bring up the correct one here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tell so us. This is now. So the first. Okay, so the first two pictures were my mother's side of the family. Um, this is now my father's side of the family. So the gentleman on the right side is my father's father, Wisaburu Sakata. And he would become one of the first managers of the Japanese Kona coffee mill. Next to him is my grandmother. And next to her are her two sisters and brother. But if you look right in front of my grandmother, you can barely make out there's a little boy also dressed in white, kind of blends in with her dress. And that is my uncle Harold Sakata, who would um, go on to become a uh, Olympic weightlifter. He would take the silver medal in the 1948 Olympics and then become well known as a professional wrestler. I think you have another picture with him as a wrestler. Yeah. Yes, there he is. All right. So his wrestling name was Tosh Togo. So his last name, his middle name is actually Toshiyuki. So Toshitogo was a variation of his middle name. And then while he was a professional wrestler, he got discovered and would become an actor best known as Ajab in the James Bond movie, Goldfinger. Look at that. And, you know, uh, many of us have, have memories about this wrestling at the Civic Auditorium. Um, and look right. at this poster. You look down below. Uh, general admission was a dollar and twenty cents. Um, yep. Or if you wanted to go to the dress circle, it's a dollar fifty. Or uh, reserve ringside, dollar seventy five, uh, and it says tax included. Um, Amazing, right? <laughs> yeah, it would be so funny because I remember, you know, at small kid time, we'd go see my uncle wrestle and they'd, they'd be fighting with each other. And then we'd go to his condo after and all of them were sitting down together drinking beer. <laughs> you know, and I can also remember his daughter, you know, would watch the wrestling and get see her father get beat up and she would cry. And then we would go to the condo. And then again, she would be confused because they would all be sitting down, <laughs> talking and drinking beer and eating food together. <laughs> so your uncle, your uncle um, uh, Harold Sakata, uh, as you say, not only was known as a professional wrestler, uh, also got into uh, the movies. And um, correct, you know, and there he is. Um, there is right. odd job. Um, from the yeah, James Bond movie Goldfinger, right? Correct. And, and um, you know, and then and what people some people may also remember is you know he he would actually wear that outfit quite often, and he actually did also the Vicks cough drop commercials where he would cough and chop and break up all the furniture. <laughs> so I don't know if you remember that, he was also in Gilligan's he was in Gilligan's Island in that outfit. Uh -huh. And then he was actually friends with um, some people that owned a seashell place on the North Shore on Oahu. So people would actually see him on the highway um, waving, trying to get people to come inside to the, the this um, shell place. <laughs> what a colorful, colorful life uh, your Uncle Harold had. And, um, you know, we, we got a chance to, to enjoy him on, on so many different ways on the movies and commercials. And uh, people remember him very fondly, too. Uh, he passed away in uh, 1992 yeah, in Honolulu. 
Um, yes, correct, correct. No longer with us, but um, boy, fascinating, fascinating uh, life that he led too. So let's see now. You, uh, although your family up there in Halualoa, up in the coffee land, and you know the pictures were showing uh, coffee, and of, of course uh, cultivating the coffee lands was a huge part of um, the family's uh, sustenance. Mm -hmm. That continues down to right. today. Um, uh, you brought back um, a bag of. Uh, uh, two bags of uh, sakata coffee that that I that we enjoyed over here. Uh, but, right. Uh, you were born on Oahu. On yes, correct. Uh, okay. Yes, correct. And so and so, so, growing up on Oahu and your teenage years, um, what was that like? What was what was going on? There? So um, I was actually when we were when I was born, we were living in Kalihi. Then in 1961, my parents bought a home in what I call the New Halava Heights subdivision. Um, we were the second house built. Turns out the first house was uh, was owned by the Suganuma family, um, relatives of Auntie Pele Suganuma. So we moved to what what my relatives refer to as the country. Right now it's in the middle, but back then Aia was the country. So spent my life growing up in Aia and ended up going to Aia High School. And while at Aia High School, I would meet four gentlemen who would later on grow into becoming very well-known kubuhula and also well-known and part of the Hawaiian Renaissance. So that would be up there. And um, Uncle Jar uh Uncle Daryl Lupinui was one year below me, and two years above me was Daryl Lupinui, Thaddeus Wilson, and O'Brien Yasello. And back then, I don't know if you remember, but you know, when you were interested in halau, it was a matter of being invited to join a halau. You didn't just join a halau. So I was actually very fortunate. It turned out in the same week, a couple of years after high school, I was asked by um, through a friend to join Waimapuna with Daryl Lupinui, but also a couple of days later, asked by another friend to join a new halau from a kumuhula had just Miki. So I went to Waimapuna and I remember dancing. We did the duck walk for like two hours. And I can remember t at least twice. I, as far as I know, I went blackout, but you know, I was still <laughs> dancing, right? Um, and I thought this is way too much for me. So I ended up joining the second halau which was under the direction of Uncle Charles Ka'upu. So that picture you just showed is me dancing um, Puohone at our very first Ho'ike, my very first Ho'ike. So oh my Aia was significant, you know, not just as the place that I grew up, but also for hula as well. Yeah, um, your love for hula continues and your passion for all things uh, connected to the islands and for the tradition, the dance uh, continues down till today. Um, no right. question. No question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So and then, as we talk, somewhere along in there, somewhere along in there comes uh, something quite interesting, and, and it almost uh, you're talking about. You remember the moment when uh, mm -hmm. uh, this happened, and I, I wanted to share that because this became this became something that um, was. Uh, continues to be a classic, and this is you were uh, one of the co-creators of Pigeon to the Max. How did that happen, Ken? Right. So again, going back to my connections to Aia, um, I had a good, really good friend who I used to see at parties, and he would constantly talk about writing this book. And he was carrying around the manuscript for the book. He would talk about it all the time. Well, fast forward. A couple of years later, at, we were at a party, again in IAL, at this condo overlooking Cam Drive-In, and we were sitting in front of the television, and again, he talked about the book. So I remember I turned to him and saying, you know what, write the book, and I'll help you, or stop talking about it. <laughs> so he agreed. So we started writing the book, picked up a third part, uh, partner along the way, and after almost two years, we were POW, uh, time to publish, Nobody would touch it. So I told my partners, you know, why don't we just do like we do in Hawaii all the time and do pre-sell. So we pre-sell about 2,000 books. We had printed 4,000 books. We couldn't sell the others. I remember my father told me, you know, you're going to have all these books stuck in your garage, you know. <laughs> um, so I said, it's okay. You know, so we pre-sold books and then we still needed money. So I went to the bank 
took everything I had in my bank account except for $2 uh, um, and paid for the books. Um, fortunately, at the time, there was a disc jockey, very well-known and popular disc jockey named Jay Akuhit Pupuli. You probably remember him, yeah? Absolutely. And yeah, and he was, at the time, from what I understand, the highest paid disc jockey in the world. Well, he heard about the book, loved the book, and put the word out, and we sold the 4,000 books in just under a week. So I said, you know, let's do 20,000 books the next time. And then that way, that'll last us a while. It took two weeks to produce the 20,000 books. It came out. We sold 20,000 books in four days. <laughs> and from there, it, it kind of went crazy. So Pigeon to the Max, I'm very humble to say, went on to become the best-selling locally written book in the history of Hawaii. So that was followed by Pigeon to the Max Hana Ho, uh, Hawaii to the Max, Fax to the Max, and Pooh Boost to the Max. Um, and then in 1986, um, which is the last book, is when I made my way to California. Wow, what a legacy of that <laughs> classic, classic book, Pigeon to the Max, and all of the uh, uh, books that followed it. Uh, down till today, it is still referred to as uh, the primer for, um, um, you know, Pigeon English. Here's a, here's mm -hmm. a friend of ours, um, Haley, and she says, I still have my Pigeon to the Max. I love sharing it with non-local friends and watching their faces twist into weird shapes <laughs> as they try to figure out what the heck they're reading. Thank you for all these years of fun, Ken. Aww. Very oh, very kind. Yeah, so our our intent was, you know, not necessarily to make it, although it, it's technically a pigeon dictionary, or pigeon English dictionary, it was to celebrate culture. You know, so one of the first things we actually did was to do a presentation to the Department of Education in Hawaii wow. um, because we wanted them to understand the cultural significance of, of pigeon English, right? Um, and that it's fine to teach children and they should learn how to speak proper English, but you know, there's also a time and place for pidgin English as well. And we were actually able to get the state house of representatives to do a proclamation also acknowledging the cultural significance of pidgin English. And what year was that around, um, Ken? That would be in, that was before I left Hawaii. So sometime I would say in the early eighties. Wow. Early eighties. So you, you, yeah, so you, you know what? You know what, bro? You guys was like Panasonic. You guys was ahead of your time, bro. You know what? I you know, and you, yeah, you know, but you know what? Here's here's the thing. I, you know, you and I have spoken about this before. I really believe that we are blessed with many things in our lives. Yes, and for me, I really believe that who I am is not necessarily because of me, but even more so because of who I come from. You know, and so I appreciate the fact that you gave me a chance to share the background of my ohana, right? Um, I am in my mother's father, my mother's mother's family, um, the firstborn child and son, grandchild and grandson. And I am the firstborn of a firstborn of a firstborn of a firstborn. So I'm a fourth generation fourth, fourth uh, firstborn. So I believe that I am the keeper or holder of all that came before me. Yeah. So now even pitching to the max, you know, I was very blessed to be at the right place at the right time. Mm. Right. So it's not that, you know, necessarily that we were that special. We were just very fortunate to be at the right place at the right time, you know, and, and I'm humbled to have been a part of celebrating the cultural and historical significance of all these different people that came to Hawaii, you know, and the fact that we created a language. So, yeah, well, thank you. Appreciate yeah. that. Well, you know, fast forward, it wasn't until about three years ago the state of Hawaii formally recognized Hawaiian Pidgin English as a language so right. that, you know, all of us local guys, we're now bilingual, right? We can speak. Right. <laughs> right, 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 right. You know, and, 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 what, and, and what people may sometimes forget because it's been so long is it's the fact that different cultures came together that this wonderful language and culture, you know, got created, you know, so it's really something magical that in Hawaii, something like this would occur. 
you know? Um, and it's still alive. There's still new words that are created. I hear words all the time that I don't know, yeah. right? Because I've been gone for a while. So, you know, even for me, I'm still learning, right? It's good. And and it the whole, the Hawaiian Pidgin English is a living, breathing, evolving language, right? Uh, and you're absolutely correct. Absolutely. A couple of years ago, I, when I, pre-COVID, went back home and my cousins go, Oh, cuz come on, you like go down wikes. We're going down wikes. And I said, Excuse me? Yeah, yeah you let go. We're going to jump in a car. We're going down wikes. I said, Wikes? He go, Oh, cuz you've been away a long time. Wikes, Waikiki. Waikiki is wikes. Oh. Right? oh right. Okay. Or, or, the, or, or the opposite, right? There are words that you and I use growing up time, like, like hamajang and. And words like that, they don't use it anymore, <laughs> right? So I, I use words in Hawaii, and they think, "Hey, who are you? What you saying?" <laughs> What's the last time you heard somebody say "wop your jaws, brah"? You know that comes from the oh, yeah. Our generation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, or the fact that there's also you know people may not know there's differences between the islands. Yes, right. So Honol Honolulu pigeon is very different than Big Island pigeon, and even Kauai pigeon, right? Kauai they'll say some plenty. You know, which is not necessarily you don't hear that so much on 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 Oahu, but or even Big Island, but Kauai, some plan, some plan, good fun, some plan, food, some plan, something, <laughs> right? So a little bit, you know, it's it's awesome how it also even within the islands, you know, it began to change and became more regional. So there's a big discussion: is it ice shave or is it shave ice? So um, people 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 on Kauai yes. go, we don't get ice shave. I go. Shave ice? No, no, no. We get ice shave. Okay, <laughs> let's just do it. <laughs> right, 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 right. Good fun. Awesome. Well, uh, we have quite a few of our friends that have uh, dropped in, and uh, if you got questions or some comments um, for Ken or for our Aloha Friday show, we welcome the comments as um, as we talk a little bit more about um, about Ken's journey that finally, finally led Ken. Right here to um, to our sunny shores, right here in in um, uh, Southern California. And in fact, there's this uh, classic picture. Let me see if I can uh, find this guy. Oh my goodness, who is this handsome guy with all those lays? Here? <laughs> so that you know, remember that's back in the days when you could actually see people off at the airport, yeah. So this is a picture of me from 35 years ago last month. So this year marks my 35th anniversary. So I was working for a company. I was a operations officer and responsible for the move. Um, and that is the day that I actually left Hawaii. My agreement was to stay with the company for one year, um, which I did. Um, and at, at some point after that, the boss decided to move our offices up to Sacramento. I went up to Sacramento. I looked around. I says, hey, no one can see the ocean. I cannot work here. And I resigned. <laughs> bro, that's what's island. You know, bro, man, no can see the water. I know. It's like, well, water. Well, hey. Water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I resigned um, and became a co-owner of a design build business in Laguna Beach. And part of the reason for that is I wanted to be by the water, oh. right? So it was awesome. Spent my days in in board shorts and tank tops. Um, after that, I was co-owner of a commercial print business in Newport Beach and then in, in Irvine. Um, and then I retired. Yeah. You know, I retired. Here we have, um, we have Ma Mahina. Mahina. Uh, and um, she she is um, on Moku Okeave on Hawaii Island. Aloha, it is my Hanai sister. Woo! Aloha, Mahina. <laughs> <laughs> so nice to have um, our, our our family check in with us over here. And uh, thank you so much yes. for those comments. Keep them coming. We love it. We love it. So now you are here in sunny Southern mm -hmm. California. Uh, we move right. forward now, and um, you uh, you come across. I'm going to just drop a couple words here. You come across something called hot hula, and of course, right you hear hula. Hey, I I know hula, you know, but this is hot hula, and so you had some curiosity. What right. the heck is this hot hula? What happened? So I, as I mentioned, I had retired, and then I heard about this new format kit that came out called hot hula fitness. So I thought, you know, I know a little bit of hula, so I'm going to go check out the class. 
So I went to the class and it kicked my behind. <laughs> so I, I ended up staying with the class for a couple of months. They had their first certification for new instructors. I attended because I thought, you know what, maybe I can just, you know, teach part time or be, you know, be, be busy for a little bit. So went, got certified. And I thought, I have no idea what I'm doing. These people that were there were fitness professionals, have been in the business for a while. So I got certified, practiced for three months. I auditioned for 24 Hour Fitness. And they actually, they hired me <laughs> and then um, gave me three time slots to teach the format. So started teaching this class called Hot Hula Fitness. It's called Hot Hula Fitness, but it's actually a blend of Polynesian styles um, together with hip hop and reggae. So started teaching that. Um, and today is actually my 11 year anniversary with 24 Hour Fitness. So did that. Um, wait, wait, today, today? Today, today. You today know, is 11 years with 24 Hour Fitness. You know, um, there which I'm, why, why we come together over here, you know, and there you go with a celebration. Uh, exactly. In fact, that's a picture from exactly a year ago today that uh, celebrates my 10 year anniversary with the company. So, wow. and in fact, that very picture, if you can see the picture, I'm actually on a stage. So when I was teaching the class, the hot wheel class at this gym, which is here in Costa Mesa, I could look over and see the pool. And I could, back then the, the classes were small. You know, I, I would look over and think, oh, those people look, don't look real happy. And the teacher was talking. So I thought, you know, I called my boss and said, you know, I want to teach aqua. So they said, good, go and check out this lady who is considered to be one of the masters of aqua. So on a Wednesday, I went over, I observed her class. I never even do the class. I was in the jacuzzi, watching the class from the jacuzzi. Next day on Thursday, I went back to the Costa Mesa gym to watch that teacher. Teacher didn't show up. I ended up teaching the class. The bosses were so happy that I stopped the riot of the, the students that they gave me the class. And that was the beginning of my my journey with, with Aqua, but even more particular, my journey in being committed to supporting our kupuna with health and fitness. So I worked at building the classes from an average of back then it was maybe 15, 20 people in the classes, that particular gym. Um, I grew to as many as 90 something people in the, in the pool. Yeah. And then fast forward the following year, I thought I need to add weight training. So I, same thing. I told the boss, I want to teach senior fitness. She said, go and see this teacher, which I did twice. The second time I saw her, she says, what are you doing next month? I says, I don't know. She says, you're going to teach the class. I said, no, I'm not teach. I'm not training in this. She said, no, just teach it. So I taught it for the next month. At the end, she came back and said, guess what? I said, what? She says, I'm moving to Las Vegas. The class is yours. <laughs> so again, like we said earlier, right? Things are predetermined for you, right? So that's how I started teaching senior fitness. Right. So fast forward at right before the shutdown a uh, year ago, March, um, I grew my class schedule to 16 classes a week in five different formats at seven different gyms. And in 2019, the last full year of my teaching at 24 Fitness, I taught just over 23,000 people. Oh, my goodness. 23,000. Oh. Amazing. You know, and, and my commitment really is, again, with the kupuna. Um, my mother, um, at one point, uh, was watering her orchids. She ended up turning fast when the phone rang and fell. And that's when she ended up finding out that she had osteoporosis. So mm. as things got worse, she ended up almost at a 45 degree. And unfortunately, there was not much I could do for her. So really, the work that I did and still do now, because I still do teach outdoor classes, is in honor of my mom. Um, you know, because, you know, we do things to honor our ohana, yes? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and what I'm seeing here, um, Ken, is, you know, the underlying theme is finding ways um, to stay connected um, with the family, stay connected with the tradition of caring for our kupuna, uh, things sure. connected with the island, things connected with uh, the culture of Hawaii. 
and that has been an underlying theme through all of these years, no matter where you've been. Uh, that's that's absolutely. Uh, that is absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know what? You know, we, we're all the same, right? Especially us local people from Hawaii. We know it's not about us. It's about the ohana, mm -hmm. right? So the question is not what can I do for myself? The question is, what is my kuleana? What is my part to give back to the ohana? You know, and like I said, you know, my my involvement with fitness has as much to do with my love and my respect for my mother as much as anything else, you know, and on the other side with my dad, you know, um, like many locals, you know, I go through periods of missing home and missing Hawaii a lot. And my father used to raise goldfish and guppies, which I have done also over the years. And he was also very much a plant person, you know, so he grew these beautiful orchids, and and had plumerias so you know at some point um this is probably about maybe 15 years ago i started collecting plumerias you know to connect not just to hawaii but also to connect to my dad so started doing plumerias and you know us in Hawaii, you know, we don't pay attention to the names. We, we don't know the plumeris of names, right? I can remember growing up in Halava Heights, you know, down the street was this really beautiful dark red. So I used to call it the, the dark red one that's behind the lava rock wall, right? <laughs> and then up the street was this really beautiful, it was a real tiny white plumeria. I used to call that one, you know, the one by the corner house, you know, and then um, by the border water supply in the front was this round plumeria, you know, that, that I used to also see all the time too. Um, so fast forward, started growing more plumerias in more recent years. And then I started going to the plumeria society meetings and I thought, wow, these plumerias, some of them have names, you know, and I never knew they had names. You know, I didn't, one I, name, I didn't know either. Right? It was just plumeria is yeah. plumeria, right? Um, how many right, right, right. We talked about. Yeah, right, yeah we talked uh, about the one in front of the the one in front of Kamaka's house. You know, the brown <laughs> one that he likes all the time, or the one you know by the Shell station. Right. We don't know names. Well, then this one name in particular stood out for me, and that that plumeria is one of the first plumeria to be registered by the Plumeria Society of America, and it's called Pu'u Kahea. And I thought, you know, I know the name because it is a name of a house. A historical house that still exists now. It was built by the manager of the Waianae sugar plantation for his Hawaiian wife. And I thought, these people don't have any idea what these names mean. So it began my journey of actually studying the names of Plumeria, the background history of who named them, where they came from, any historical or cultural importance as well as any mo'olelo, right? Any legends or background information about these plumerias. So I started to grow plumerias. You know, and Stanley, now... Stanley, Stanley Gomes over here um, is saying, he's listening and saying, there's definitely a full circle, brah, you know, when you talk about your dad. Absolutely. Family, right? Um, Absolutely. It's, right? It's, right, connecting to the ohana, right? Yes. Plumeria connects me to ohana. Um, all many of the books and research I had done, especially while I was studying um, hula with halau with my different kumu, um, I all that information now comes together with plumeria. So it's 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 a funny thing how, like Stanley said, you know, everything is. First of all, the journey is not the hula kai is not an accident, right? We are predetermined to be on a certain journey. I have always loved ike. I have always loved knowledge, and 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 I find that it brings me great joy to share this this information um so now all that i know right my connection to the aina in hawaii my connection to hula and halau and all the information that i study all manifests itself through plumerium so let me let, let's let's just uh and not many of us because i I have no clue of how Pumeria was introduced to the islands. Maybe just give us a clip. Okay. Uh, you know, just sure, sure, sure. a little okay. story. How, so, how does that yeah, so first of all, you know, some people think that Pumeras are from Hawaii and they're not. Um, most Pumeras come from Mexico, parts of South America and the Caribbean. So the first Pumeria is um, attributed to a gentleman named William Hildebrand. 
And he actually was a very important person to um, the Hawaiian kingdom. He was the, as a medical um, professional at Queen's Hospital, he was the chief physician to the royals um, and was also one of the founding members of the Hawaii Medical Association. So he loved plants. He was a botanist and a physician, and he ended up actually buying property, about 13 acres, I believe it was, from Queen Kalama. Um, and during his travels, would bring back plants and animals that would help benefit the kingdom of Hawaii. And in and around 1860, brought in the first plumeria. And that first plumeria is what we now call the celadine, or what we call in Hawaii, the graveyard flower, right? The white with the yellow. The white with so, the yellow. yeah, so he brought the first one. He would grow plants on his property, eventually sell his property to a sea captain and his wife. And on her um, passing, she bequeathed the property to the city and county of Honolulu. And her name was Mary Foster. So, you know, Foster Botanical Gardens, Foster that Garden. is the property. Wow. So that's the property that was that was connected to him. Very quickly, the first director of that gardens was a gentleman who is also well known in Hawaii named um, Howard Lyon uh, of Lyon Arboretum. And he is, uh, is the person who brought in the second plumeria, which is now known as the Singapore because it came from the Singapore um, Arbore Arboretum. Wow. So strong connections, Jeff. Yeah. yeah. So what you see now are some of the plumerias that I grow. So within the plumeria community, I am known as the person who specializes or, or, or focuses on a lot of the Hawaiian classics. And something that else that people may not know is, you know, many of the um, people of importance in Hawaiian history, um, as well as royalty, have plumerias named after them. Huh. On the 150th anniversary of her birthday, the Bishop Museum asked a gentleman who is considered one of the foremost authorities of plumerias in the world, a retired professor of UH, um, his name is Richard Criley, to name a plumeria for um, Princess Bernice Pauwahi Bishop. So there's actually a plumeria named um, Pauwahi Ali'i. Huh. There's a small white plumeria named King Kalakaua. There is actually um, also another plumeria named by another very important gentleman of plumeria in Hawaii. His name is Jim Little. He is the father of famed photographer Clark Little. He's a retired professor of photography. So I connected with him a couple of years ago for information um, and he named a plumeria for Queen Kapi Olani. So there's that one that you're looking at now, um, right, are some of the reds. You know, it's it seems uh, as, as I remember, um, you know, small kid growing up, that we would always we would stay away from from the the color uh, pumaria because they wilted a lot faster. You had some pumaria that were a lot hardy and they would they wouldn't get all dried up and turn brown. Um, they were right, right, right. the most popular, yeah, because they they stayed fresh mm -hmm. a lot longer. Right, so that first plumeria I spoke about, the celadine, what's amazing about that is that's one of the strongest of the plumeris, right? So like like all other plants, it all comes down to where the um, their blood, if you will, comes from, their, um, the species that are in the background. And some plumeras are stronger, some smell, they all smell different too, right? Some have um, a honey scent, some smell like coconut, some are sweet, some are not as strong. Um, so, you know, all different textures, different um, stability as far as the flowers are concerned, and different fragrances as well. And, you know, just that that aroma, that smell of a pumaria lei triggers in our minds, right, so many memories, either at the airport Absolutely. or at a party or a great a mayday. Remember mayday? Baby, baby luau, a mayday. <laughs> celebration yeah, 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 yeah it's amazing how just that the the fragrance of the pumeria for many of us triggers instantly so many memories you know uh absolutely yeah, celebrations for sure for sure mm -hmm. um, and so you know just sharing some of the, the various different um uh, variety of of pumeria here uh and, and um uh, i know the big white flat 
pumeria. Um, and I know there's a better name for it, but we call them a Samoan pumeria because they were big, you know, a lot larger, and um, the, the petals were big and flat. Um, I'm sure there's a mm -hmm. name for it. You probably know that. Um, I think you, the one you're talking about is called Samoan fluff. Ah. So, but so it's a little bit of, it's bigger, but it's a little bit floppy. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I remember saying, "Oh, that's, that's a Samoan pumeria," and I went, "Oh, okay, <laughs> you know, but that is actually you say Samoan fluff." Um, I that sounds like the one it is. So that's one of the more um, um, better known of the whites. There's also another white I mentioned earlier, the one that I grew up I used to be in front of the border water supply in the Halava Heights. Um, and that's called the Singapore. And the Singapore is known because it has a really tough, um, thick green leaf and the flowers are, are more rounded in their shape. Now, the one that you're showing has an interesting history. That one, that particular one is, believe it or not, called UH Orange. Huh. Now, it's, not, it's called UH Orange not because it comes from the University of Hawaii, but there was a woman named Cheryl or Cheryl who lives here or used to live as far as I know here on the mainland. And she used to sell plumeric cuttings down in San Diego. And she got this cutting and she called it UH Orange because it came from near UH, not on U, uh, the campus, but near UH. Um, and she called it UH Orange to differentiate it from um, others that she was selling. But if you notice, some of the, the flowers are a little bit more yellow, and some a little bit more orange. And one of the things that I learned here, I didn't know this in Hawaii, but heat makes a difference. So in many cases, if there's more heat, then there's more color that comes out in the plumeria itself. Wow. So I'm here in Costa Mesa, near the border of Costa Mesa and Newport Beach. So we get a lot of um, moisture, um, but not as much heat. Where someone like you, right, you get a lot of heat and maybe not as much moisture. Um, different people have different micro microclimates. So the growth of the plant themselves, as well as the color, um, are affected by heat and sun. That reminds me so much of um, growing grapes for wine, right? Um, where mm -hmm. the soil, the temperature, the amount of rain uh, on the vineyards affects from year to year how that right. grape um, turns. Uh, it, it, when it turns into wine, it has different flavors and uh, different nuances. I didn't realize that uh, the same thing with uh, the flowers or with plumeria. Wow. Absolutely. So we could take a plumeria. You could grow a piece of it. I could grow a piece of it. Somebody in Palm Springs could grow a piece of it. Somebody in you know LA could grow a piece. And the flowers would look different. Hmm. So much so sometimes that you actually think that there are a different variety of plumeria when in fact it's the exact same one. So, you know, oftentimes we get asked, you know, can you, they'll show us a flower or show me a flower and says, oh, can you tell me what, what this is called? And it's almost impossible, right? Just because so much of it can be affected or changed the same plant because of the, where it's grown and the, the microclimate. The environment. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I have, um, I've dubbed you Ken the Pumeria Whisperer, because we have had we have had other conversations, and, and one of the things I shared with you is my experience. Uh, in the summertime, we have you know so many Ho'olauleas outdoor festivals up and down mm -hmm. the coast here, and invariably sure. there's a vendor that's selling Pumeria, selling plants, and I overhear some of the kupuna, you know, they're they're coming along with their shopping bag, right, and they and I hear them talking between each other. They go, you know. I bought one last year, you know, and 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 it looked really good over here, you know, and and, and I took them home and I took good care of it, and, and in no time the bugger just went shrivel up, a thing that oh, 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 mucky, yeah, po ho, po ho the money, I mean, I mean that good money, you know, po ho, no buy, yeah, 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 yeah. It's almost yeah, yeah, as yeah. if the vendor had um, sabotaged um, the, <laughs> they blame mm -hmm. the vendor, you know. So I just thought, um, generally speaking, although it really depends on the climate where the primaria is going to be growing. Are there some general um, uh, pieces of advice or general information that folks should have? And folks that are listening, if you Absolutely. have any questions about growing primarias at, at your place, go ahead and post them because you've got the primaria whisperer right here that can give it to you straight. Uh, he might say, 
don't bother. Um, it, it, it's not going to happen. But I don't know. Let's see what happens. So, so what's so, the general information? Um, okay. Absolutely. So in Hawaii, pretty much what we do is we cut them, we dry them, and we plant them, right? Um, and in Hawaii, it works well because we have a volcanic soil and it drains real well. So with plumerias, when, when you cut it, you need to make sure that the cut end dries or what we call callus, right? So that's number one. Um, you can do that multiple different ways. What they now do here on the mainland is they'll cut the end, make sure it's a flat cut, and then they cover the end with saran wrap and either rubber band or electrical tape so that when it dries, it dries, it dries flat. That's number one. You need to make sure that you callus or dry the end. And then number two, when you plant it, you need to make sure you plant it either in a, whether it's in a pot or in the ground with soil that drains well. So like most plants, the plumeria needs water, but it doesn't want to sit wet. You know, and most people will kill most plants, including plumerias, but most plants, not because they underwater, but because they overwater. Wow. Now, somebody will say, well, you know, in Hawaii, I remember we would cut it and put it in water. And, you know, believe it or not, you can do that. Because what happens is um, in the soil, if you plant in the soil and the end is not calloused well, there's a bacteria that will grow and that's what will rot the end. Huh. So there are many people oh. who, who prefer cutting and putting it in water and water rooting it instead of rooting it in the soil. But pretty much that's it. Cut, cut clean, dry or callous the end, and then put it in soil or potting soil that has um, good drainage. So whether it's pot or in the ground, because Marty is asking um, mm -hmm. pot versus ground. So what I'm hearing is uh -huh. whether you choose a pot or a ground um, to put your primary, you just got to make sure you got good drainage, um, Correct. good water filter Correct. through. Yeah. And here's the other secret. You water one time. This is what I do. You water one time and then you leave it alone. <laughs> I know you want to water it again, but you leave it alone until there are, in what I tell people, at least three to five leaves, at least three to five inches long. Then you water again. Um, the other thing that people need to know, you know, which is what I told you when we first began this conversation, is the plumeras have a dormant season, right? They go they go to sleep. So it's like when you're sleeping, when you're sleeping, you don't need food. You don't need water. You just need to sleep. Um, so during the non-growing season, which is what we are in now, right? The winter, uh, plumeras don't need water. If you give them water, there's oftentimes more of a chance of them rotting. So it's only when you start to see the ends of the plumeria, even if within an established plumeria, if it's starting to push out new growth, then you can start to water. Now, if you have a brand new cutting, you try to do the best time um, to cut it is in the springtime, right? As you get more towards the end of summer or beginning of fall, that's when it starts to get a little tricky. You know, and like all people, you know, I, I will get cutting sometimes late in the season and oftentimes it won't make it because, you know, it's just way too late in the season. So. Number one, cut clean. Number two, dry. Number three, put it into good draining soil, whether it's in the pot or in the ground. And number four, water once and leave it alone until you see at least three to five leaves, three to five inches long. I'm taking notes over here. Taking notes here, okay. Ken. <laughs> Rosie says, in Southern California, is it safe to bring the pumeria out now? Um, well, we Okay, so that is going to depend on where in Southern California, right? So I'm of the belief that you, I want to grow my plants what we call hard. I want to give them, uh, keep them outside. I keep most of my plants outside. The only ones I bring inside are the ones that are either newly rooted at the end of the season or didn't root well, uh, really well. Then I bring them in the house. The rest of them all stay outside. Now, Southern California has a great diversity of, of climates as well. So what I can get away with here in coastal Southern California, which is um, very, very easy to grow plants, you might not be able to come up and grow, um, be able to get away because you have, your climate is more um, extreme, right? Not close to the ocean. Yeah. 
pe or people in Palm Springs. So the, the answer her, to her question is depends on where in, Ca in Southern California. Okay. Uh, Marty says, what about uh, fertilizer? What, what, what kind of fertilizer would you be using? Okay. So in general, there's, there's different points of view about fertilizer. Any balanced fertilizer will work. Now, what some people will sometimes do is get a high middle number because they want to push blooms. Not a good idea. So one of the things that I do is in addition to a fertilizer and I like time released. So any balanced fertilizer is great. Osmocote has a 10, 10, 10 or 15, 15, 15 works fine. Um, you fertilize once or, you know, or however often the direction tells you is great. So I prefer that. Um, I, I in particular use a fertilizer from a company that's back in Florida that specializes in plumerias, but again, it's time release. In addition to that, I put um, one tablespoon per gallon of coffee grinds, used coffee grinds, of eggshells, crushed eggshells, and of um, Epsom salt. And that I do about, about once every, during the growing, growing season, about maybe once every one to three months. Um, and that just adds a little bit more nutrients into the soil. Eggshells. My, my eggshells. Coffee grind. Eggshells for the coffee, use coffee grinds, Epsom, Epsom salt. Yep. Yep. So you just add it to the surface. Again, one teaspoon per gallon of pot and just kind of mix it in. You can also mix it in with the fertilizer, the time release fertilizer, all at the same time. Wow. Now, there are people that, that do a much more complicated fertilizer um, regime, but I, wanna, I like to keep it simple. Yeah. Yeah. So um, our good friend Marty just sent me a picture. He said, hey, take, okay. a, look, take a look at my, my pumerias by my house. Uh, this, is, um, this is my wife, Patricia. Uh, they live in Paramount. And... Um, uh, what do you see when you look at this here, Ken? Okay, so a couple of things. Number one, you can tell most of the plumerias have have very little leaves on them. So this, my guess, is a picture that was taken, taken recently. During the dormant season, most plumerias, unless it's of the Singapore line, um, will drop the leaves. So I can tell that this is probably taken recently since most of the leaves are gone. A um, couple of things that are good. The plumerias have a lot of space around them so that there's good airflow. Um, it is in pots, my guess. Yep, they're all in pots and against the, the house. So it probably both the um, the house itself and I think that looks like concrete on the bottom um, are good because it will be given um, reflective heat, radiant heat into the plants. Huh. So the plants look good, that looks good. All right, Lots Marty. Of, uh, you, you and Patricia are uh, get um, get a thumbs up from uh, the Pumeria Whisperer. <laughs> <over here. laughs> right, and in Paramount, they get a lot of heat, so mm. they need to be very careful to make sure that you know the plants don't burn. So, believe it or not, Pumerias can get sunburn. Yeah, Pumer and uh, what Marty says some people this picture was taken today. He says that's the one. Yeah. Ah, okay, perfect, perfect. So I can tell by how the sun is with the house. It doesn't get 100% sun, which is perfect for his environment, especially because probably if it got full day sun, um, which some people prefer, um, it would be sunburn. So what people will do, you know, the toilet paper roll, they cut it and they stack them around the stems or they um, paint, they actually paint the huh. stems to avoid sunburn. Wow. You know, Stanley is saying, um, I think another book is coming out with all this information, can you do Pumerias to the max? Pumer <laughs> <laughs> you know, so one of the things, as I mentioned, you know, that I, I um, am being encouraged to consider is writing a book to document all these Plumeria, the, not just the history of Plumeria, which has already been documented, but more importantly, the history of the naming of Plumerias. So a lot of this background information, I mentioned two gentlemen earlier, Jim Little, who is the gentleman who owns one of the largest pomerial farms in Hawaii now, out in Pupukea, and Dr. Richard Criley, who is a retired professor of UH um, and one of the foremost authorities of Plumeria, they were able to give me background information for where some of these names came from. 
So there's both the, the meaning of the name, right? Literal translation, any kauna attached to the Hawaiian names or any mo'olelo, but there's also who named them and the background information of the names. Um, like even that, that plumeria, I mentioned King Kalakaua. So Dr. Richard Criley, together with one of his then graduate students, a gentleman named Ted Chen, um, are responsible for collecting many of the plumerias that became a part of the UH collection. Um, there's a growing field of plumerias out in Waimanalo. Um, and Ted Chen, again, would go around to different people's houses and stop by. So he went to this one house and he asked the man for a cutting of his tree. And he says, what's it called? And the man says, it doesn't have a name. And it, that owner is the one who gave the plumeria the name King Kalakaua. So wow. that's where that name came from. Yeah. Um, there is a very famous red um, called Duval Shell Red. Um, and Richard Criley and Jim Little went to visit this lady out in my, my city of Aiea, um, uh, Gloria Schmidt. Um, and from her, they got a cutting of this plumeria called Duval Shell Red. This lady, Gloria Schmidt, was originally from the island of Kauai. Um, and she loved this plumeria. But this family, the Duval Shell family, didn't share cuttings. So she basically climbed the wall and stole a cutting. Wow. And that's how she got a, a cutting <laughs> of the Duval Shell. Since then, the family has now shared cuttings, so you can now actually get it. But, you know, that's where the name comes from. It was actually the name of the house owners. And the UH got, got a cutting because this lady, Gloria Schmidt, stole a cutting <laughs> while she lived on the island of Hawaii. Right? And there's another famous orchid or excuse me plumera called cindy schmidt that was named for gloria schmidt's um niece yeah so i love not just the not just the, the translation of the names but also you know who named them where did all this come from uh harrison deckard who's all all the way in minnesota burr bra you're not going to be growing wow. any plumerias right now but he says do you have a youtube channel or other sites i'd love to view botany and fitness videos so uh, uh so un un unfortunately no i do not but but actually you know kamako going back to what you just said you know there are people that grow plumeras all over the world um even in places that snow right obviously they have to do different things there are many people like i mentioned i keep my plumeras outside um there are people who bring all their plumeras inside huh. right yeah. Um, I know of um, someone who is here in, in Southern California, and every year she brings all of her plumeras inside. We're talking about 1,200 plants. Mm. I know of people back east and, and around the country who actually have plumeras planted in the ground, and every winter they dig them up and wrap the root ball and bring them inside i'm serious Whoa. so you know we're you know coming from hawaii right we think i have it's just a plumeria i just leave them outside right yeah. or even for me here in coastal right might as well stay outside pretty much huh. but there are many people that grow in all different kinds of 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 climate all weather yeah marty says his wife patricia has one that the roots push right through the clay pot and root it in the ground. He said, yep. I'm not going to stay in the clay pot. I like getting that. I, I got to get in the item, man. Let's get going. Absolutely. <laughs> so what that's, you know, that brings up a point. So there's something called plunging. What people will do, like my plumeras, I keep them all in pots to control the size. And then also I can move them around or I can figure out what I want. But what some people will do because they don't want it in the ground, they want to control them, is you actually plant half of the pot in the ground. And then the roots come out from the pukas down below. Got it. And once they hit, once they come out of the pukas, they grow significantly different. Wow. So when I look at a plumeria, you can see there's little nubs. And I can I check the spacing between the nubs. So I have one plumeria I just saw this morning that I've had for probably in a pot for 15 years. So up until recently, the nubs were maybe only about this far apart. Well, the roots are now in the ground, so now the new growth, the nubs are about this much apart. Huh. Amazing. You know, uh, a little bit of a side note. On a personal note, um, my my auntie Dora, Dora Brown, had Dora's lay stand from um, the the 40s and 50s in Chinatown. Dora's lay wow. stand was the place that everybody would go for graduations, baby luau's. 
They leased some land out Sunset Beach, Pupukea area. And as a yeah. kid, I was growing up in Waimea Valley. So they lived in Kalihi on Gulick Avenue on Kalihi. But the whole family would come down, stay over at our house in Waimea. And all the kids, you know, they would all go out to the Plumeria um, uh, land, collect all that, make all the delays, you know, hard work because they would go up right. to boat day. Boat day was a right. huge huge thing right. because all the ladies you know and my cousins all over there you know oh. the the, yeah, yeah. the girls the girls would sell the ladies uh, on their arms and stuff the boys would be diving for coins that the tourists would flip off of the um the boat right the the lurleen the matsonia and all that in the harbor but right, great right. memories of pumeria so sometimes when i smell the fragrance of pumeria i think about my cousins about those big heaping wheelbarrow full of pumeria and making the lays and it's ending up for boat day uh, in the harbor by aloha tower so lots of amazing memories about the the pumeria plant my goodness um we've come to the end of our time together where did the time go kim why we're just getting started i know right <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I appreciate being invited and, oh. and being a part of this program. Mahalo, mahalo, uh, nui lo, mahalo piha for joining us. Uh, thank you so much for uh, our friends um, with their comments and questions. And um, I know you can reach out to Ken uh, on Facebook, Facebook messaging. You can drop by his house, uh, bring him, bring him plate lunch, and tell him you know you want to. <laughs> well, you got some questions, but you got to bring plate lunch um, and. Got to bring paint lunch. Got to bring. Well, Manapu is okay, too. Manapu, Manapu okay. <laughs> <laughs> or Malasadas. Malasadas is good. Malasadas. So, Marty, <laughs> stop stop by, you know, um, Auntie Miley's or stop by Hong Kong Bakery or buy some Manapu or plate lunch on your way to um, Ken's house. Um, that's that's how we roll, okay? That's how we roll. <laughs> uh, again, uh, mahalo, uh, Ken, for uh, joining us. We My love pleasure. having you. Uh, please come back and visit again. Um, our uh, our holly is always open to you anytime uh, on uh, the Aloha Friday show with the Sandwich Islands Network. Uh, good fun, good fun, uh, and hopefully, once um you know once um the uh, the pandemic is uh, kind of uh, loosens its grip a little bit, and uh, we can see each other. Look forward to seeing you. We have this evening. Goodness, absolutely. I would love that. Way too long. Way too long, my friend. Um, I just want to tell you also um, about um, other shows that we do have here that's presented by the Simon Kaida and Social Network. Um, we've got something called the Two Baboos Crew. The Two Baboos Crew. Uh, no script, no, no pants. Uh, every Wednesday at 1 p.m., Two Baboos Crew and Stanley Holmes and myself, and we have a lot of fun. Join us every Wednesday. We'd love to have you uh, come and uh, hang out with us. Uh, also, uh, the, uh, we also have On the Porch every Monday night at the Block. It's a virtual hangout with uh, Hawaiian Hawaiian You can check us out on the Kabaka Palm Facebook page, Savage Island Social Network page, and uh, join us on the Zoom call. Good fun uh, on the porch every Monday, every Monday. So, until then, we say a week home. We will see you all. Thanks so much for joining us. Aloha to everybody.